Good morning. The Lord Christ be with you. My name is Buckley Walker. I'm the director of music here at First United Methodist Church of Mayfield. Uh, we want to welcome each of you. If you're joining us uh, on the radio, happy to have you there. If you're on Facebook Live, happy to have you there. Please leave some comments down at the bottom of the screen. Let us know you're here. Got some prayer requests. Put those in there also. Um, just want to make one quick announcement, uh, just in case no one has heard, there will be no parking lot communion today after church, and it is due to Joey being under the weather, which is why I'm standing up here this morning. Uh, we pray that Joey will get better and gets the feeling better. I think he is a little bit, and we, I know he's going to, I think pretty sure he's going to hit that doctor's office tomorrow and try to whip this thing. Speaking of prayers, we want to continue praying for those with the COVID-19 illnesses. Um, Gretchen Myrick's uncle was hospitalized this week. Want to keep them in your prayers. The family and friends of Ella Jones, she passed away earlier this week. Uh, the David Tucker family had a loss. His aunt, who was 105, passed away this week. And Nancy Smith's daughter-in-law, Jan Smith, was hospitalized this week also. Please keep them in your prayers as we go throughout this week. Uh, we also want to lift up one of our churches in the Purchase District. This week's church is Milburn United Methodist Church, and their pastor is Jonathan Althoff. The candle that is on the congregation's right and on my left has been lit to represent the folks at Milburn. And again, please keep them in your thoughts and prayers this week. Now on to shout outs. I want to say a shout out to the holiday decorators of our church. Uh, they did a great job. Even though we're not gathering and stuff, they still decorated for us and made things look very festive, and we really appreciate the people taking the time and effort to get that done. Our next one is Dean Crislow. We are missing you. We love you. We just want to let you know we're thinking about you. Our last one, Nathan Kent who is our Mayfield City Police Officer, let's see, Chief of Police, I'll get it out right. Wanna lift them up and give them a big shout out for all the work he has uh, done and is doing with us in our community. And now, let's see, looking at the thing. Opening prayer will be done by Jennifer Walker. Good morning. Most wonderful God, foolish and flawed though we are, we too delight in your beloved Son. As in his name we gather in the house of many praises, may the heavens be opened for us, that we may catch a glimpse of that light and love that transforms our common days with the beauty not of our making. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Good morning and welcome to Mayfield First. We're delighted to have you join us for worship today. And you may find uh, the bulletin at mayfieldfirst.com. And we would love for you to join us uh, whenever you can at our virtual worship service. The first scripture reading today is Genesis 1, 1 through 5. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. 
and there was evening and there was morning the first Good morning, my name is Greg Knight. Please join me for the Nicene Creed, which is printed in your online bulletin. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, and only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the light of the world to come. Amen. Oh, Jesus. 
Our second reading today comes from Acts 19, 1 through 7. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No. We have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, Then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. We come now to a time of pastoral prayer followed by the Lord's Prayer. I invite you to center yourself and to listen carefully for the words of the Holy Spirit even as I speak this prayer aloud on your behalf. May these words be your words as well. Let us pray. God of peace and justice, we cry out with all our heart to you for aid, for assistance, our sins are manifold, and our nation suffers. Riots threaten to replace difficult conversations. Chaos subsumes peaceful protest. Violence interrupts the work of the people, and our country shudders from the division. God, we own our wrongs. Hear us admit our sins. And we pray that you would hear us as we cry out for your pardon. So many of us have allowed self-righteousness to replace your righteousness. We know this because we have stopped listening to you and chosen idols of our own fashioning. We have wrongly decided that it is more important to be right than to be kind. And as a result, we continue to justify our hatred for those who oppose us and exile one another to the other side at the first sign of disagreement. We have remained silent as our family Friends and neighbors rail against one another for temporary problems when there are eternal stakes on the line. Worst of all, many of us have been encouraged to do these things on the basis of our faith. Free us from this fallacy. Purify your church and return us to your fold. Above all, forgive us for the sins we have committed and for our sins of omission. For the things that we have done that grieved your heart, we are sorry. And for the things that we have left undone that were commanded by your word and exemplified by your son, we are sorry. Remind us that we are sinners saved by grace 
and that your love for us is the same as your love for those whom we count among our enemies. Renew our love, our love for our neighbors, all of our neighbors. Soften our words. Give us the courage to be humble enough to admit our wrongs and mend our fences. Recreate our hearts after the image of Jesus Christ. Let our passion for our nation be replaced once again with a passion for the kingdom of heaven. Forgive us, we pray. Heal us, we pray. Make us whole once again. For we ask it in the name of the risen Christ who heals us, who loves us, who makes us whole. We recall now the words that he gave to his disciples so that they might pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We have come to that portion of our service where we return to God that which God has given us, at least in part. If you have a tithe covenant with Mayfield First, this is your chance to exercise it. If you're a part of another congregation, please consider sending your tithe there. If you would like to make a gift, however, let me tell you how all of this works during this season of uh, not in-person gathering. If you would, go to mayfieldfirst.com and click on the giving tab. You'll be guided through a safe and secure process to provide your financial information so that you can transfer whatever funds you feel is appropriate based on the tithe covenant you have with God. If you would prefer to do that by SMX, SMS, you can text the word promise to the number on your screen. And as always, you can mail a check in to Mayfield First United Methodist Church, 214 South 8th Street in Mayfield, Kentucky, 42066. If you have questions or comments about the way that we are doing this, if there's something that we can help you uh, to accomplish, uh, because the technology is not always easy for everyone, please let us know. Contact us in the office by giving us a call or reach out on any of the social media that we share. We'll be happy to get in touch. An email works just as well. Uh, and now, would you join Buckley in the singing of the doxology? The gospel reading this morning comes from the gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter, verses 4 through 11. I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. This is the word of God for you who are the people of God. Thanks, Thanks. be to God. I 
Will you pray with me and pray for me? Now, O Lord, may the meditations of our hearts together be pleasing in your sight. Let the words of my mouth, let all the things that we say and think and do here in this moment be pleasing and acceptable to you. We ask this for the sake of the Christ. Amen. The God we serve has been about beginnings since, well, the beginning. Beginnings are infused with possibilities. They are filled to the brim with questions about what's going to come next. And in those newborn moments, every answer is a possibility. What will come next? Every answer is a possibility. Every birth is full of potential. Every new business is a chance for the fabric of the community to be changed. Every new student is a scholar in the making, a virtuoso waiting to be revealed, an athlete with a chance to break records, to bring honor to his school, to her school. Life is filled with beginnings and endings. And it is no surprise that our God, who so enjoys a good beginning, displays a touch of wrath when we foul up a beginning. Take Adam. We're barely two chapters into the book of Genesis when the tone changes from possibilities to poison. And yet, God sets Adam and Eve off on a new beginning. Possibilities. They're wrapped, though, in punishment. Noah comes along a few generations later, and the possibilities, well, they seem to have been exhausted. God is fed up, and God repents of God's creation and sets out to begin once again. Possibilities are wrapped this time in preservation. And right away, as soon as that's over, old Noah gets smashed in his new vineyard, and we see that all the possibilities, all the possibilities were present the whole time, both good and bad. Starting over became a matter of course after the judges, after the folks who were called together to bring Israel into God's way of doing things from time to time, no kings, just leaders, folks who could rightly divide between what is true and what is false. But people began to crave a king. All the nations around Israel had kings. They wanted a leader that they could love, a leader that they could adore. And kings, as you know, well, they come and they go. At least most of them do. But I'll get back to that. So they chose Saul. Saul became the king. He was head and shoulders above the men around him. And yet he fell from favor. The possibilities ran out for him. A new king was needed. Possibilities abounded once again, this time wrapped up in procession, a procession of kings. When the old king fails or dies, the new king comes along. And David began wonderfully and failed mightily again and again and again even though he was one of God's favorites the apple of his eye a new king would be needed Solomon one with such a great deal of potential blessed with wisdom and then promptly failed to use it Rehoboam picked up where he left off and set about governing a kingdom that would divide more on that later as well 
So the procession continues, and the book of Kings, first and second Kings, fills with names that almost always have a black mark beside them. Sooner or later, a black mark. He did what was evil as his father did before him. Each new king was a wealth of possibilities. Each new king was a crushing load of disappointment. Even those who did what was right in the eyes of God, how could those disappoint? Because any man placed on the throne of Israel or Judah was a poor replacement indeed for the king of glory who had been and always would be the king of heaven, the king of the children of Israel. For those kings, though, possibilities were wrapped in poor excuses for perfection, frail humanity. Even in their frailty and failure, the kings were offered wisdom again and again. Prophets who spoke over and over the words of the Lord in an effort to rebuke their actions and return those kings to what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Do not speak ill of the government, Pastor. We are one nation under God. Tell that to Nathan. Tell that to Amos. Tell that to Elijah. Tell that to, well, all of the prophets. For they stood before their kings and they spoke to their faults and they renewed the vigor of God's righteousness. Some enjoyed the ear of the monarch. Nathan was close with David. Others like Elijah were declared enemies of the state. He spent a little time hiding in a cave, hiding in a cave, until God's deafening silence, that still small voice, overwhelmed him and he returned to his senses and to his duties. Possibilities wrapped in prophetic pronouncements were all too often ignored. And as a result, two kingdoms fell, a nation divided, both falling within just a few generations. Human frailty, poor excuses for the perfect king, God. No man or woman has ever satisfactorily filled that space on the throne. No human skull has ever had the wherewithal to bear the weight of any crown that aspires to the full potential of the king that God wanted to be for the children of Israel. Of course they have needed correction. Of course they have needed to be criticized. Richard Rohr has said on more than one occasion that that which is above criticism soon becomes demonic. If we can't criticize our leaders, if we can't speak to their faults and frailties and offer correction and rebuke, then perhaps we are saying to ourselves that they are above reproach and beyond our criticism. If Father Rohr is right, that approaches the demonic. So this procession of kings, it's not too foreign to us, but the bloodshed and intrigue around the monarchies of Israel and Judah, those are mostly absent from our lines of presidential succession in this country. Each newly elected leader has possibilities, even the ones with whom we disagree, even the ones that we despise. But the presidents, they do not bear the full range of possibilities. Presidents cannot bear the weight of these possibilities for, like the kings of old, they are poor excuses for perfection. Israel and Judah chose to forsake the king of heaven again and again. They put their faith in the strength of strong men and the prophets wailed and railed against their choices. The psalmists wrote hymns, and one of them reminds us, Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He answers him from his holy heaven with the saving power of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They are brought to their knees and fall, but we rise up and we stand firm. If only there were a perfect president, but there isn't. There never has been, there never will be. 
If only might was enough to secure our place in the world, but it's not, and it never will be. If only our righteous intentions and beliefs were enough to secure our place in eternity, but they are worthless, filthy rags, rags that we all too often use to clothe ourselves in what we think of as righteousness. If only, if only there were a perfect king when Christ was born in Bethlehem of Judea, he was delivered of Mary, who wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. The possibilities here in this new beginning were wrapped not only in those strips of cloth, but in the promises that had been made, made by those same prophetic voices in some cases that we were just talking about. God's promise to David, again, delivered by Nathan, whom we've already mentioned. When your days are over, Nathan said, and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring, David, to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. We believe that because Jesus was of the house of David, that this refers to the kingdom that Jesus is king of, the kingdom of heaven, the one you and I are trying to participate in when we can get out of our own way long enough. God then promised to Isaiah sometime later, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, God with us. So God returns to be the king that he's always wanted to be. If we would just let God be that king. God's promise to Israel delivered by Micah. You know this. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from days of old, from ancient times. With each new beginning there, the possibilities were wrapped in promises. And with the new beginning of the life of Jesus, the promises were coming to pass. In Bethlehem, those promises did come to pass. When Jesus came to the Jordan for baptism, the reading for today from the lectionary, God pointed out the perfection that he saw in Jesus. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. The Psalms of enthronement they spoke of the king in these terms from time to time. These very words were often thrown at the feet of the monarch in Israel, in Judah. But they believed that to their peril, knowing that their inability to aspire even to the righteousness of God prevented them from being the king that Israel needed, the king that Judah would need. It took the incarnation of Jesus Christ to bring about anything approaching the perfection required. The kings of Israel and Judah, they failed. They divided the kingdoms. Presidents in this country have failed. They have come close to dividing this nation. In the past week, we have seen what happens when good people believe in the possibility of one man's perfection. It's a false hope. The conspiracy theories that fuel this thinking are not new. They've been around for centuries, perhaps since the beginning. We've been putting our trust in horses and chariots for a long, long time now. They are flawed. They are frail. The leaders that we have, even when they are chosen by God, they are still only human. But there's no reason for us to despair. As one thing ends and another thing begins, if we can take heart in the face of our own ending, if we can take heart in the face of death, our mortality, knowing that there is life beyond, that something else is coming, why can't we do that in life? We can face any difficulty that tomorrow might bring. 
knowing that there is life beyond. We can take heart in the face of tumult and adversity because we do not place our loyalties in any one leader from history, from the present day. We don't place our faith in any one person or even any one party. As Americans, we place our faith in the Constitution. Public servants pledge their oath to support and defend that document. That's where their loyalty lies. And we too must hold that document sacred because it's not perfect, but it's the best that we have. We are a nation of laws and the peaceful transfer of power is indicative of the hope that we must have. Not just the hope that we have for a future because of God and his love for us shown through Jesus Christ, but because of the hope that we have in the ideas that are embedded in the document that is the foundation of our law. But make no mistake, that document is flawed. It cannot be perfect. It is not scripture. It is the product of human efforts and it contains the reminders and the leftovers of the thinking of men who believed in slavery, who believed in gender inequality, and the inability of the common man to vote unless he happened to be a landowner. All of those things had to be corrected. There are amendments to that document. No, for the Christ follower, our hope is not in horses or chariots or presidents or Congress or constitutions. Our only hope is in the only one with whom God is well pleased. Why? Because he is the new beginning every time. He is the alpha and the omega. He is all beginnings. He is all endings. He is God with us. In the service of death and resurrection, which has been required of us far too often lately, we are reminded that death is not the end. The promise of Jesus Christ, quoted from John, the revelator, a prophet in his own right, I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I hold the keys of hell and death. Jesus says, because I live, you shall live also. That is hope, my friends. In the beginning and in the end, in all beginnings and in every ending, and in the beginning that follows after, Jesus Christ. He awaits us as we start fresh, he goes with us as we start over. That's what baptism is all about. There is a reason that I open worship most Sundays with grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ who was and is and is to come. It is a reminder that every service is a celebration of things that are ending and things that are beginning. It is a reminder that when good things end, God is still God. When bad things end, God is still God. When atrocities threaten to overwhelm us, God is still God. And when we are tempted to embrace those atrocities, to defend those atrocities, or God forbid, commit those atrocities, God is still God. And God will not be trifled with. May God have mercy upon our souls when we attempt it. Church, we, we do not, we must not, we cannot put our faith into any one person, man or woman, who sits upon a seat of power in a place that few of us have ever even been to. That man, that woman will eventually fail us. Some will fail miserably, some will fail moderately, all though will fail us in some respect. They're human, that's how it is. Let us instead put our faith in the one who has been, who continues to be our savior and our friend, the one who was, the one who is, and the one who is to come. For he is the God of all things ending, he is the God of new beginnings, the author and perfecter, of our faith and our salvation. 
So whether we are coming to the manger to see the Christ child born, whether we are standing by the River Jordan as he begins his ministry, whether we are standing by as he helps people start their lives over, beginning after beginning after beginning, perhaps we're standing by as Paul teaches and preaches about the baptism of the Holy Spirit that comes upon the heels of our baptism. Whatever beginning you're ready for, know that God has already been there waiting for you to toe the line so that when the light turns green, we can all go and move forward together. Old things will pass away. New things will come to pass, but they too will pass away. Let us hold firm to the one thing, the one to whom we might owe allegiance without worry even Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let us pray. Gracious God, our lives are filled with the tumult and adversity that we see on television, that we read about in newspapers, and the anxiety that rests within our hearts and we don't need anybody to tell us about. We ask that you would come among us and allow us to celebrate our baptism and its renewal so that we might go forward in the name of Jesus Christ, praying his name aloud, living his name out loud. Amen. I want to invite you to make a decision today. If you've never followed after this Jesus Christ who was and is and is to come, the only one with whom God is well pleased, I want you to make that decision today and call us, contact us, let us know about that. If you have been holding back, you've been trying to do your own thing, or you've been chasing after your own hero, your own idols, lay them aside. Come back to Jesus. Listen carefully for the sound of this, the Holy Spirit's voice speaking your name and urging you, coaxing you back so that as we go forward, church, we might know that we are in this together. Dedicate the rest of your life to Jesus Christ. If you're a part of another congregation and you're ready to be a part of this one, for whatever reason, talk to that congregation first, your pastor, your Sunday school class, the people you sit with in church, and then come talk to us. We'll be happy to put your name on the line and, and share in ministry with you. And finally, if you just need these next few moments to pray, listen as you pray. Do as much listening as you do talking so that when God speaks your name, you know what God is saying. For he is our leader, our salvation, the perfecter and author of our faith. He is our king. As we sing our closing hymn together. Glory.
May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you from the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors.